Hello everyone and a warm welcome to Directions Live Online. My name is Manish Patel and I am your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that we are recording today's session and we will be sending out a link to the recording later this week. So if you want to rewatch it, you will have that available to you. If you have any questions, do send those during the presentation. You can submit that anytime during uh, in the photo webinar panel on the right hand side. We'll leave some time at the end of today's session to answer any of your questions. Now on today's topic uh, on how the accuracy of GPS devices can be improved from a current 5 to 10 meters to 10 centimeters using Australia and New Zealand's new regional satellite based augmentation system or also known as SPAS. We have got Eldar Rubinov and Chris Marshall from Frontier SI joining us today to demonstrate these benefits for users across multiple industries and to share with us the performance levels achieved by the system during testing. Eldar is an SPAS technical manager with Frontier SI and he has a keen interest in things, uh, all things in positioning and geodesy. Chris Marshall is an SFAS engineer with an interest in using spatial information and positioning technologies to help evaluate system performance and promote the uptake of forthcoming satellite infrastructure. Welcome, Chris and Elda. Thank you, Mish. Awesome. So, before we get started, we would like to do a small polling and we'd like to get some of your feed, uh, response. So let me just start that. You should see the options coming up on the screen. So how familiar are you with SPAS? So we can see a couple of responses coming through. So we will give it a bit of while and we'll see how. Wow, it's good to see a few SPAS experts in the audience. Yeah. I think that should do it. Uh, let us just share it quickly. So what we can see from here is we have a quite number of those from who knows a bit of things in SPAS. Um, there are a few, uh, majority of them would like to know more about the current scenario or the current developments. Um, some of them are, I think, quite new. To know about uh, what SPAS is, I think this session might be quite beneficial to them as well. And we have 24 persons who actually have heard this before. So I think that that's a pretty good start. So I think with, without any further ado, I shall pass the presentation on to Chris and Elda. What do you think? Thanks, Manish. All right. So I'll start today by talking about the basics here. So what is the SPAS? So SPAS stands for a satellite-based augmentation system. It's an infrastructure that supports wide area regional augmentation through the use of satellite broadcast messages. The system improves the accuracy, the reliability, and the availability of GNSS positioning for users within the service region. The SPAS is capable of providing instantaneous submeter positioning for users. So this is all possible due to the cause or continuously operating reference station infrastructure across Australia and New Zealand. These precisely located uh, continuously operating receivers are uh, used across the network to compare their very well surveyed positions to their currently reported positions and calculate correction messages. These corrections are then transmitted by an uplink station to a geostationary satellite that sits above Australia and New Zealand and distributes that corrections to users throughout the, the entire region. These same corrections are also available through the internet if you can't see the satellite for whatever particular reason. Uh, this service region covers Australia, New Zealand and our maritime zones as you'll see a bit later on. So the SPAS technology was originally designed for aviation safety for allowing precision approaches into aerodromes. So this means that the SPAS inherently includes aviation specific integrity messages called protection levels but these are not particularly useful for major, for sort of other industries apart from the aviation one. However, the improved positioning performance delivered through an SPAS 
does have significant benefits for major, uh, so across all industries. So I'm just going to hand over to Eldar, who's going to talk you through the SBAS testbed. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so I'll spend a few minutes talking about um, the SBAS testbed that we run over a couple of years between 2017 and 2019. But first, let me just go back a step. So Australia actually applied for SBAS first in 2011 and New Zealand in 2014. But in both cases, the bids were rejected uh, due to the fact that the, they were mainly concentrated with the aviation sector. And the outcome of, of the review was that it was difficult to justify the significant investment involved in establishing SBAS infrastructure, which would only serve the aviation sector. And any future investment in SBAS needs to cover a wide range of um, uh, industries. So in late 2016, another bid was made, and this time it was successful, and the government has invested $12 million into a two-year test bed. Um, and then New Zealand has also come on board and also contributed $2 million, uh, to to also be part of that testbed. Now, the aim of the testbed was twofold. Firstly, it was designed to um, demonstrate the technical capabilities of, of the service, but also, and probably more importantly, it was to demonstrate the economic benefits that the service would bring to the to governments, to, to both countries. Um, now, uh, this uh, test bed was a joint effort between a number of different organisations, which you can see down on this slide. So Geoscience Australia and Land Information New Zealand were uh, the two government organisations that are in charge of providing the service. Um, so Frontier RSI, where both me and Chris work, um, we used to be a cooperative research centre for spatial information. Um, and we have been tasked with... Uh, doing the various industry demonstrate a project and, and getting an uptake um, of that technology. Uh, and then the three private companies were involved with the actual service provision. So Inmarsat has provided the geostationary satellite, Lockheed Martin has provided the uplink antenna in Urala in New South Wales, and GMV has provided um, all the algorithms to compute the corrections uh, for SBS. We've also worked very closely with an economics consultant, Ernst Young, to uh, prepare the economic benefits report, which I'm also going to talk about a little bit later. Um, throughout the two-year test bed, we have run 27 demonstrator projects in 10 different industry sectors, as you can see on this slide. So we have covered everything from all the transport sectors, like aviation, rail, road, all the way to agriculture, construction resources, and also spatial and consumer sectors. So I guess most people are, on this webinar would be GIS and mapping professionals. So the spatial, you know, you'd be sort of considered as in the spatial sector. That would be probably the most interest. But as you can see, SBAS does have some very wide um, implications for many, many different sectors. Okay, so at the end of the test bed, we have published a number of reports. Uh, they're all publicly available on our website. You can see the link on this slide. The main one is the EY Economic Benefits Report, which has, um, captures all the economic benefit information um, from all the demonstrator projects that we've run. It's a very, very good and comprehensive body of work. It's uh, 260 pages, but it does have a very and neat uh, executive summary at the start and also a chapter on each of the sectors. So if you're only interested in spatial sector and not interested in aviation, uh, you can only read that, that sector. Um, we have also done a project report where we go in detail on all the various projects that we've done and all the uh, organizations that were involved and what were the, the application and the outcomes. And finally, we also published a technical report where we've done some of our own testing. We're continuing to do um, our own testing, and this is where we publish some of the actual results that you can achieve with SBAS. So the main outcome of the EY report was that there will be a 7.6 billion um, combined value of economic benefits over the next 30 years to Australia and New Zealand, out of which Australia would 
gain 6.2 billion and New Zealand 1.4. Um, again, all the breakdowns and all the various sectors and so on, uh, you can find in the report. So that's quite a significant um, number. Now, I'll just now like to step back and talk a little bit about uh, the technical aspects of the service. So, and I'll also mention here that uh, there are now four operational SBAS systems in the world. Uh, in USA, in Europe, in Japan, and India. So currently these are four operational services that are um, being used. Uh, Russia is also has an SBAS service, but it's not hasn't quite reached operational status yet. And a number of other countries such as South Korea, China, Nigeria, and uh, all of South American region are also working on their SBAS systems at the moment. Um, all of this is all of this uh, operational systems that I've just mentioned. They currently only have what we call uh, Generation One SBAS service, so single frequency GPS. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, we actually have three different signals, which I'm going to talk about now. So we do have also a single frequency SBAS, just like all the other. Um, with that service, you can get down to about submeter accuracy with a standard of the shelf um, GPS receiver. And it does uh, vary quite a bit, you know, from maybe sort of 0.4 to 0.5 meters up to a meter or even 1.5 meters, depending on the grade of the receiver and the antenna you're using. The second service is what's called dual frequency multi-constellation or DFMC SBAS. That's a second generation SBAS. We have actually been probably the first, or maybe along with Japan, the first country to broadcast that service as when we started about three years ago. Um, this is an L1, L5 GPS Galileo service. So it has a number of advantages, such as you got more satellites, you, you know, you got two frequencies, which means you can deal with um, the ionospheric errors that affect GPS performance better and, and so on. Um, in terms of the actual positioning performance, it, uh, it's very similar to the L1 service, um, maybe with a slight improvement. But also the biggest improvement you'll see is in the difficult areas where you get access to more satellites and, um, and things like that. The last service is Precise Point Positioning, or PPP. It's a different service to the, the first two. Uh, the first two, the SBAS basically gives you instantaneous um, positioning, whereas with PPP, um, it's a 10 centimeter service, but it does take some time to get down to that level of accuracy. So it typically takes about 30, 40 minutes to get down to sort of the decimeter. Uh, we call that convergence, so as, as you turn the receiver on, uh, you know, you start at about a meter and then it takes 30, 40 minutes to get down to 10 centimeters. So these are the three services that we're currently transmitting and have been transmitting for a good part of three years. Um, this is the coverage of our service. So as you can see for the L1 SBAS, it's basically a square box, as Chris mentioned, around Australia and New Zealand and all the maritime zones and all of the islands that fall within that box. With the DFMC, it's much wider. It's basically a whole footprint of the satellite. So we can extend our coverage region um, into other parts of the world as well, into Southeast Asia. For example, technically it's very easy. We just need to add some ground stations from a particular country and then we can extend that service region to that country as well. Now let's talk about the current status. Um, the first thing I'm going to mention is that our SBAS has been given a name. It's going to be called Thousand Positioning Augmentation Network or SPAN. Uh, that's um, only been out recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Now each um, in each um, region of the world, the SBAS has a name. So for example, in, in the US, it's WAS or Wide Area Augmentation Service. In Europe, it's EGNOS, in India, it's Gagan, and in Japan, it's MSAS. So ours is going to be called SPAN. 
Now, so where are we at? So we had a two-year test bed, which actually was about two and a half years. That finished in the middle of 2019. We're now in a post-test bed uh, period, let's say. The signals are still available, um, and they will be available until 31st of July this year. After that, unfortunately, it looks more and more likely that the service will be switched off for a certain period of time, most probably until the end of the year. So it will be five to six months um, outage period. Uh, Geoscience Australia and Land Information New Zealand will go out to tender for an operational systems very, very shortly. And it will take some time to go through the tender process to pick um, a vendor. And unfortunately, during that time, we will need to have an outage. Um, it's not something anyone wanted because there are many people already who are using the service, but unfortunately it's unavoidable. The procurement process, a joint procurement process between two countries has proved very difficult. Um, each country obviously have their own guidelines and rules and so on, and it's not something I believe that has ever been done at, at this scale, and that's why it's taking a lot longer. And the, um, the idea here is to actually do it right from the start, even if it means having an outage now, as opposed to not having it right and having problems down the track. Um, okay, and the, the signals should be resumed early in 2021, and then we're looking at about four years to uh, do an open. Um, to have a full operational safety of life system. So somewhere 2023 may be a little bit later. Okay, I'll now quickly talk about some of the receivers. So basically any GPS receiver that you have, whether it's a consumer grade device or um, professional, you know, geodetic quality receiver, they're all SBAS capable. Um, some of them will need to have a firmware upgrade to know which satellite the signal is coming from and so on. But generally speaking, they're all SBS capable. As you can see, we have a bunch of receivers um, that we have been testing starting from that consumer grade, so literally $10, $15 SBS, uh, sorry, GPS uh, devices, all the way down to the sort of GIS grade and to the um, geodetic grade. Uh, so we've done a lot of testing, uh, we've published some of these results, if you're interested to know more you can always contact us, but basically it does, uh, the performance does vary. With the consumer grade devices we found, you know, you can expect anywhere from one to two meters. Once you go to the sort of mid-range it can come down to less than a meter and with, with uh, good quality GPS receivers you can get it down to half a meter or even less than half a meter. Now, all of these off-the-shelf receivers can only pick up the, the first service, which is the single frequency SBAS. We also have some prototype devices, um, as you can see here, which were made by, by GMV specially for our testbed, and they can pick up all three signals. So they can pick up the single frequency, the dual frequency SBAS, and also the PPP. And again, we've got a bunch of these devices available for testing, so if anyone's interested, please come and talk to us. We can make them available, but you need to remember that we do have a deadline of 31st of July uh, when to do any sort of testing. And finally, just because we have so many receivers and we tested them to death and we got bored and we just decided to create our own one, as you can see here. And it's really easy. You just get a GPS board, you get a Bluetooth board and the... Um, and a battery, and Chris has uh, 3D printed an enclosure in the local library for free, and we ended up with a uh, receiver that's looking like that. It costs less than a couple hundred dollars. We have, uh, or Chris has created a document on, um, on how to do it, so again, if you're interested in making your own receiver, again, come and talk to us, we can point you in the right direction. Uh, finally, I'll just like to sort of talk about why use SBAS in the first case. Uh, well, it's actually a free service. It can provide you very good accuracy, especially for sort of GIS and mapping um, users. So submit or 10 centimeter 
will generally satisfy most of the mapping users. If you have applications where you require RTK sort of accuracy at the centimeter level, uh, we won't be able to help there. You will need to have an RTK device. But anything in that submitter to a decimeter range, SBAS will serve your needs very well. It's a free-to-air service. Um, in the US, SBAS or WOS, which is the American SBAS, is the most widely used differential positioning service. So it has many, many benefits, especially for GS and mapping users. And um, the sort of benefits we mentioned before about the six or seven billion dollar benefits to the country will only happen if people actually use the service. Okay, so now I'll pass it back to Chris and he'll talk about some of the actual testing that we've done. Thanks, Hilda. So this is an Esri webinar, so I'd just like to quickly talk about some of the Esri products that can be used and benefit from the SBAS. So Esri uh, Collector for ArcGIS has inbuilt support for external receivers and allows you to go out and collect point lines and polygons and features and display them on a map on your mobile devices or your PC or otherwise. So because this has inbuilt support for an external receiver, you can plug in your receiver immediately via Bluetooth or otherwise, and immediately you'll see an improvement in accuracy horizontally, depending on what quality receiver you have. In this image, you can see around 55 centimeters being reported horizontally, and then you can go off and do some mapping with that. Similarly, ArcMap has inbuilt support. I'm assuming Arc uh, Pro, ArcGIS Pro also has the same inbuilt toolkit, which is called the, uh, the Tracking Analyst Toolkit, which allows support for real-time GNSS data collection and visualization, as well as some other advanced features around that. Of course, there's also ArcGIS Quick Capture, which is suiting even faster, rapid data collection. You can maybe imagine putting your receiver on top of a vehicle, driving around and marking things as you drive past them. So more or less, whatever your mapping use case, there's an Esri product that'll suit that, and it is compatible directly with SBAS capable receivers. So from across all of these, the SBAS will deliver improved accuracy, which means you're going to get better results more often when using the tools. So to demonstrate these benefits, we prepared a quick test. So this is our equipment set up for that test. We've used two EOS Arrow 100 receivers and a Septentrio Asterix SB geodetic quality receiver as well. All three of these receivers were plugged into the same antenna, a Topcon G3A1, via a passive signal splitter. This passive signal splitter ensures that all three receivers are seeing the exact same sky conditions and the same satellite observations as one another, so we can do direct comparisons between them throughout the testing. So I'm going to describe uh, two tests for you guys, but first the test environment was in the Docklands Park. We were walking around with the, the shown GNSS pole, for some, and it has a bipod attached so we can put it down for stationary positioning, it's capturing points, lines, and polygons simultaneously across all three of those receivers, and again, all using the same antenna. This method allows us to do second-by-second -second comparisons of the reported position, and we can compare the post-processed reference trajectory delivered from the geodetic quality receiver as a ground truth. So the two tests I'm going to be describing to you were a point averaging test. So this is when we set up the receiver and the pole over each corner of a concrete pad in the park and left it there for about two minutes at a time. Data from each receiver at each corner was then averaged to produce a polygon with four corners. These polygon captures were then compared to the area of the post-process reference to get an indication of how well it covered that area. The line capture involved carrying the receiver and pole along a footpath and some defined edges around the park, and then using that data captured to compare second by second against the reference trajectory. So from this, we did a horizontal and vertical RMS calculation to get the real-time error. So this was the, the first test, the point averaging test. As you can see here, the SBAS off Arrow 100 is shown in orange, and the uh, SBAS on Arrow 100 is shown in green, and the reference polygon underneath the two. So with the SBAS switched off, the point averaging on each corner of this polygon achieved about 14.5 meters of an estimate for this area without the SBAS, compared to the reference polygon, which actually measured up at about 16.4 meters. By switching on the SBAS in that environment, we managed to bring that estimate up to about 16 meters 
which is significantly closer to the truth value you'd expect to see. Uh, similarly, you can see the overlap of the areas is slightly different. The SBAS position has a closer mark to each corner of the actual position, where the SBAS off receiver was a bit skewed and slightly misaligned. This is fairly typical from what you'd expect from a standalone receiver. This is a pretty good standalone receiver. And this is the, the line capture test. So this test starts in the top left corner and goes counterclockwise sort of around. Uh, across the, the length of this test, you can see at the very start, the receivers are fairly well coupled. The reference path is fairly close to the position reported by both the SBAS on and the SBAS off receiver. However, after a few turns and a bit of, uh, a bit of time, the SBAS off receiver starts to drift and starts to diverge from that reference path. The SBAS on receiver, however, manages to, to maintain a good, strong coupling to that reference path for a lot of the test only having a few corners where it's slightly misaligned. So across the, the length of this test, the results are horizontally, the SBAS off receiver managed around one meter with about 2.5 meters vertically in error. And the SBAS on receiver simultaneously with the same exact sky conditions managed around 20 centimeters horizontally with a 1.2 meters vertically. So it's worth noting that this is only about three minutes of test data and the Depending on your environment, your test equipment, the receiver and the antenna you choose to use, your results may vary significantly from this. However, this should give you a fairly good indication that using the SBAS, your points, your lines and other things will be more accurate, they'll better represent the underlying result and they'll more reflect the results you'd get from a post-processing sort of solution. So if you'd like to read a bit more about the SBAS or find out some more about some of the testing we've been doing, there's a number of publications that are currently available. You can go to GIM International's February 2020 edition, in which Eldar and I wrote an article entitled Establishing an Operational SBAS Down Under. Of course, Geoscience Australia has a wide range of materials around the Positioning Australia program within which the SBAS is a part. EOS GNSS has put up an article on their website a couple months ago that we helped also write um, about the updates on the Australian New Zealand SBAS. As well as that, we've got a couple uh, papers were prepared, which we can provide to you upon request, one from the Southeast Asia Survey Conference and one from the FIG Working Week 2020. So if you're looking to find out more about how you might want to use SBAS or to get started using the latest public infrastructure for GNSS in Australia and New Zealand, just get in touch with us at Frontier SI. We're available to provide information sessions, training, or have a chat about equipment and technology and we can put together demonstrations to suit your use case and any budget of any user group. So if your organization has any interest in running a demonstration project, Frontier SI, Geoscience Australia, and Land Information New Zealand might be able to help you facilitate that. So yeah, get in touch with the team at Frontier SI, discuss your positioning needs and how the SBAS can benefit you and your organization. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Elda. That was a wonderful presentation. The Surely the future of Field to office data capture just got better with the submitter accuracy that SPAS now makes possible. Um, and I hope everyone uh, found that interesting as well. We have had a couple of questions come through. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to type out your question, you can still do that in the questions pane. I think before we quick off the questions, Chris did mention about one of the uh, portion, I think, in terms of the GPS support uh, for Axios Pro. I, Thing it's not yet in uh, in the uh, existing functionality or tools, but definitely I think there's something in the product plan, and then I think the product team is kind of working at the moment on it. Um, so I, I think in case if that's not um, that's not much um, confusion there. Um, all right, we do have a question from Nick Miller, and he says, when will SPAS support use with AR solutions such as Trimble Site Vision? and VGIS to look at BIM data? That's a good question. Um, well, it, it actually already supports it. So with VGIS, that's um, kind of uh, agnostic to the receiver type they're using. And if, as long as the receiver you're using is SBS capable, then you would be able to use that. With the Trimble, again, it it's, uh, it's only with the Trimble receivers, but the SBAS is already there. With Trimble, the way it works, it will look at all the available services 
uh, that are available to that receiver and it will pick the, the best one. So if, for example, there's a Trimble service that will provide better position performance, it will pick that one. But if it thinks that SPAS will give you the best performance, you will actually go with SPAS. All right. Thanks, Elda. I hope that answers your question, Nick. Uh, we do have one question from Gordon, and he says, can my phone receive SPAS? It's a very, very good question. At the moment, no, but um, very soon it will be able to. We're actually working on a project right now with um, RMIT University and um, a UK-based company to actually do some SPAS positioning on a mobile phone. Um, so yeah, at the moment, no, but very soon we're hoping to. Thanks, Elda. Um, we do have one question from John. I think um, you uh, Chris, you shared some of the test scenario that we did with Collector. Uh, just out of curiosity, is there any additional configuration that we need to make um, in terms of using it with a Collector or Survey123 or any other applications? So the, the short answer is no, it's pretty much plug and play. As long as your GPS receiver is outputting the correct NMEA sentences that give the positioning information as well as the quality information around that position, then it should just all work together quite nicely. Thanks, Chris. Um, we do have time for one last question. And Phil says, what is the performance of SPAS under Canopy specifically for the forestry industry? It's a good question, Phil. So um, if you have a look at the Frontier SI technical report, one of the additional tests we did uh, as part of the test bed was actually looking at forestry environment. We did some testing under canopy and we found that submeter accuracies are achievable under canopy. They don't affect the SBAS as much as, it might, as you might think. Um, a lot of it, honestly, it depends on the antenna and the gain used in the antenna and the quality of that antenna in the receiver as well. So depending on what your specific use case is, we've demonstrated positioning that still works under heavy canopy, including pine forests and plantations. Excellent. Um, thanks, Chris, for that. Uh, I think that's we do have a few more questions, but that's, that's all the time we have today. If we have not answered your question, uh, Elda and Chris will surely reach out to you with the response. Uh, you can still submit your questions if you have through uh, if you have any questions further. Just quickly before we sign off, stay tuned for our upcoming webinar on the latest release of ArcGIS Pro 2.5. Ta and Evet are going to share some of the functionalities and updates related to ArcGIS Pro. So if you think that that might be interesting and you would like to know more about it, feel free to register. Uh, and also let your colleagues know about this. Also take, uh, do take time to fill out the survey at the end of the session. Um, you, or you can send us your feedback at or questions at events at svaustralia.com.au. With that, um, I would like to thank Elda and Chris for taking out time and sharing with our GIS community. It was quite an interesting session, guys. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you for the next Directions Live online.